it's just not a good intellectual exercise. It's a good life exercise mm. too. Well, I guess with your with a phone in, you're getting the black and white, aren't you? And you're the nuance. Yeah, a bit of that, but you can push it. It can be, you know, I can. There's some things I can't be black and white on. Yeah. You know, sometimes I, I, I did start like funny when we did the death penalty the other day, and I stated my view on the death penalty because it's all right there. You can, you can't, you you can't be impartial on some topics. Mm. I can't be impartial on some topics. Mm. But um, yeah, it must be hard because I'm imagining that when you're on air, you've kind of developed a bit of a persona for yourself, and so I'm guessing that sometimes that sort of slips and your own personal views and you know we all have different upbringings and different experiences of the world and some stuff is more triggering for others and mm. so there's there must be some conversation topics that are quite triggering for you personally based off of your own personal experience there are there's some things I, I just I, I I find it very difficult doing for example animal welfare phone-ins because I just know if somebody calls up and says oh well, they're just animals I just think the ignorance is just uh, I know I've got to rise above it. But I just feel it's really pathetic. I just feel really triggered. And so I never do them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there are other things which which are, you know, as awful and as terrible, but it's something that I just care. care. So of course I care passionate about, you know, you know, people in rubble and people in war, but it's just, there's something about ignorance. And in that particular instance, you get, you get ignorance. I can't stand ignorance. I can't stand people who haven't bothered to research and mm. or don't understand and have been living in their, their own behind their own walls and in their own silo. And uh, in a scientific ignorance, it just it just winds me up when it comes to other um, living species. And I, I just I know you agree. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, we were talking about this yesterday. Wasn't yeah. it? We were talking about what our own personal things are like triggers in people yeah is that yours as well no funnily yeah. enough it like, was one of mine though like, it was mm. one of charles and mm. i was saying oh that's funny because ignorance isn't a personal trigger for me but it's more um like the belittling and um yeah it's it's more being ignorant but then also stating your opinion as fact or putting other people down because it, my view is that we're all ignorant until we're not so i've been ignorant on certain things like topics and some of them like you know to do with animals like i was saying before i uh when i was a teenager we swam with dolphins because yeah. that was what people did when they went on holiday we went to cuba and we we're like oh we loved animals this elephant was trekking or whatever yeah mm. exactly and that was an ignorant thing to do but we didn't know better and now i do so i wouldn't do it and so i have i have time for people if they're ignorant but then they take time to learn but it's the people that don't bother to make any effort to change or learn or grow and and also as a person you know personally i'm you know super ignorant with certain things like politics and things like that i just don't take the time to learn about because i'm just not that interested so i'll be the first to put my hands up and say i'm not an expert on a lot of things but i know that about myself kind of thing but it's yeah it's the ignorance in the pig-headedness I but guess. in that in that instance you're admitting that you don't know much about it and that's fine and you're not actually bothered about necessarily finding out of it but i guess for you when you often get people ringing in who also haven't been bothered to find out stuff closed about minds. it but closed yeah. minded about yeah, it. yeah i mean all for open minds we've all mm. i think all the people i know and love and cherish uh, have open minds I, you know i just can't mm. i can't um, imagine being building a wall around yourself so i d nope, don't want to know that nope yeah. don't want to learn that nope don't want to go there it's um it might be a, a comfortable way to live because they go through life unchallenged but i just you know i just i mean here in politics as well without being impartial there you hear people and you still feel that they're at the oxford union debating society mm. <laughs> and they're using the you know sophistry is the great word isn't it they're using false arguments and they know they're false arguments but all they're doing is showing off their debating skills and trying to best the other person and you just want to say get over it grow up mm -hmm. actually grow up and you know yeah. look at the facts assess the facts realize that that's wrong yeah that's right and nobody's all wrong and nobody's all right because because we're just human we're just mm. we're just flesh and blood and we make mistakes but let's just look at it and and see what is true and what is good and what is bad and what isn't true and then the world will be a better place thanks very much for having me on i'll see you later yeah. <laughs> Nikki Campbell. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> okay uh you know where yeah. the door is <laughs> but there's one time where when it comes to impartiality on the air i had a, a rant against uh trophy hunting 
And um, I really, I really had a, one of those rants you hear on commercial radio where you're not allowed to be, where, where you can be impartial. Mm. And then we got about 20 texts agreeing with me and stuff like that. And I got slightly ticked off, but I made the case that most people agree with that and that's fine. But then on another occasion, and I just about got away with it, on another occasion, I think it was when Donald Trump said that the answer to gun crime and to mass shootings in schools would be to have teachers be given guns. Do you remember that? Mm, do yeah. teachers in schools? <laughs> yeah. Could be yeah. Given yeah. Guns. I used to be a teacher, and I yeah. can attest to the fact that that is a terrible. It idea. works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it works. <laughs> and I've got a gun on me now. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and I said that, and I said, "What a stupid idea!" Da, da, da. And I got into trouble for that because it was actually a political position, and it was mm. slagging off Donald Trump. So when you get somebody like Trump come along, um, uh, it's you know, you, it's it, that, that's a difficult one. It's a really mm. difficult one because you've got to be politically impartial. Mm. But he's a <laughs> Yeah. I mean, oh, have about, we about, about, about decided whether we're going to allow swearing on this podcast yet? <laughs> we are. We are. We are. Okay. I, I can't uh, say yeah. that. I can't say that word. No, I just but, said it for comic effect. Yeah. yeah. He's, but he's a lovely you know, person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you are. You're being impartial now. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed. It's a bit of both. We're all a bit of both. <laughs> yeah. Aren't we? Yeah. You know, yeah. some yeah. people say, oh, look, look at that pure evil. Look at what happened under Pol Pot. Look at what happened under Hitler. Look at how the mm. mass people were were hypnotized. And the, look at the guards at the death camps. Look at what they did. To a certain extent, that's us. Mm. We're capable of that. Human beings are capable of that, given the indoctrination, given the brainwashing, given the, the uh, given the origins, given how you've grown up. So it's not like a, a them and us situation. Mm. They're but for the grace of the fates, the gods go any of us mm. that's not to say these people don't make moral choices but what i'm saying is that is what we as human beings are capable of absolutely yeah it's no it's no new thing this mm. has been happening for many many years and will continue to happen yeah and when people years. say oh look they behave like animals i say excuse me which animals yeah <laughs> which <laughs> yeah. animals behave like that chimps yeah. can get a bit feisty but look at the beautiful the elephant society or look at bonobo mm. society and look at look at the beauty there and the, the the reconciliation and the love and the mutualism i love the mutualism of elephant society they're mm. all there for each other yeah all the time don't you yeah oh, well you know how i feel Nikki about that and I and I know how you feel about it as well um and I think we wanted to talk about a little bit about that as well and and your sort of personal connection with wildlife and nature and and pets as well because I know you've got an amazing uh, you know relationship with Mac Maxwell mm -hmm. and Misty uh, and Maisie yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Misty and Maisie yeah I've got two West Highland oh. Terriers mother and a daughter I've so got, got Max I've got a dog called Maisie as well <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Kindred spirits. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's something about amazing. Uh, I just, I couldn't live without animals in the house. Mm. And for me, dogs are, they, they stand kind of at the gateway to the wild because they're, there's, there's a little wisp of the wolf. There's a, there's a vestige of a wild creature on the tundra far, far away in a wild place. And you can see little echoes of it in your dog. Mm. And uh, I mean, cats are still wild, aren't they? They're wild animals in the living room. But dogs are kind of halfway towards us and halfway towards that wonderful world. Mm. And that's why I, I love dogs so much. And I, I just think animals are the treasure of our world. And the, uh, how if somebody can't see the beauty, the potential beauty in humans and the beauty in animals as well, I think they are lacking in empathy, mm. lacking understanding. And uh, there's something emotionally stunted about them. Like people who say, oh, I don't like animals. What? Mm. What are you talking about? How can you not like animals? We are animals. They are, they're part of, and I use the word advisedly, I don't mean it with a big C, but they're part of an incredible creation. What has evolved over mm. four and a half billion years. And look look at it. Look at a pangolin. Have you ever seen anything so beautiful mm. in your life? That, that little being, that little thing. And also... You know the self-awareness of animals. They, they, you look in, you look in an elephant's eyes or a gorilla's eyes. I've seen gorillas close up. There's someone there. Mm. That's mm. the point. There's someone there. Yeah, it, it's it's funny because with wildlife, you know, there there is someone there, but there's also a, a more of a simplicity, and I don't mean that in like a, you know, a nasty way. Like with humans, humans are just so complicated, aren't we? And and animals, you just take it all back. You take away all of the ego. You strip. If you strip humans of all of the crap, you end up with primates like chimps and, you know, and yeah, for me, that's, 
I love wildlife. I feel like it's quite common that there is a bit of a disconnect between humans and mm. nature and humans and wildlife. And that's only possibly getting worse with, you know, technology and social media and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, especially since the lockdown, we've all sort of like gone into our little bubbles and now we use technology for literally everything. So we don't n almost need a connection with nature and animals. And it has oh. kind of, yeah, I don't know if it, like when people say they're just not that into animals or that into wildlife and stuff. How can you not be? It's the most beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Well, I think. And that, you make it so beautiful as well. You highlight. Oh, thank you. You highlight the beauty of it with your amazing, oh. amazing pictures. Do you, have you heard of um, Damien Aspinall? He's He has that zoo inverted commas in um, what's it called it's in it's in kent and um it's the i don't like zoos but it's mm. kind of the acceptable face of zoos and as will travis said from mm. born free it's kind of 95 percent okay mm. but what he does yeah. is his family traditionally have had gorillas and he puts them back in the wild in gabon he's got a very good relationship with the president of Gal gabon ali wow. bongo and uh, who who loved animals himself and gabon's actually a, a little bit of a uh, a hold off on some of the worst stuff that's happening and it's a stronghold of the forest elephant which is a distinct species from the savannah elephant they, they now think mm. and um, so i went to see his gorillas and they are they live in the claridges of gorillas and massive massive amount of space and uh, massive amounts of space to roam and to be warm and to be safe and they get the very best food delivered um, and first of all we went into his very grand sitting room damien's and there were pictures of his of his father had taken years ago with um uh, female gorillas with the, with the babies on their chest a human baby mm. on their chest looking at human babies so they were all part of the same family oh, it was wow. just just incredible yeah because they're not these 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 wild creatures of the forest they are you know empathetic loving loving beings mm. and um so we went in and i I observed them. The first thing that I observed up, up, up at the cage, and like, I don't like cages, don't like animals, but it was my chance to see them uh, close up and to see what was going on. Um, mm. And um, the, the fingernails. Mm. They were our fingernails. Mm. They were our fingernails. Yeah. And also, I got a very strong, um, not unpleasant, musky smell because I was quite close, and it was a smell I recognized uh, as, mm. a, a, as a not uh, unfamiliar smell that one might mm. have because we've lost our, I lost our sense of smell and appreciation and understanding of smells and so it was just it was almost like a, well it was it was a spiritual moment and then we went up and we had a look and there there was this adolescent who'd been misbehaving uh, annoying other members of the family uh, sort of poking them and, and, and being bad and being mischievous and the the silverback because it's a male dominated society gorilla society uh, and the, the silver mat went up to this teenager and just roared. <laughs> God, that sounds like my dad. And exactly. A teenager. <laughs> exactly. And then the teenager behaved himself, you know, mm. uh, after that. Yeah. It was incredible to watch. And I said, <clears throat> excuse me, I said to Damien, see that one, well, the withdrawn one over at the corner there, just, just on, on his own. Um, and uh, I said, what's the story there? And he said, well, she was um, rescued by helicopter from bushmeat hunters when she was a baby. <clears throat> it was sold to um, somebody in, in Paris and spent her life in a flat in Paris. And because, of course, she got big and strong, she had they had to sedate her with morphine. So she's a morphine addict, but we got her off mm. the morphine. But because of the experience she's gone through, she's st you know, st still mm. re really withdrawn. It's tragic, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. The illegal, ugh, mm -hmm. the illegal pet trade. And we, when we talk about pets, we think of like dogs and cats and you know, the animals that we love. But mm. God, some of the animals that have gone through the illegal pet trade and they're just some of the worst. You know, they're in some of the worst conditions. Um. So, in your personal life, how how has your? Sort I said of I wasn't going to talk about my personal. Oh, life. Oh, yeah. okay. I, how do? Oh, <laughs> I've had you've had people like that in interview. I've had people like that. <laughs> Well, and like the stuff about their personal life is in their book. 
Yeah. And then yeah, you yeah. say, can I talk about your personal life? And they say, I'm not talking about my personal life. I'm just going to talk about what's in the book. And I said, it's in the book. And I said, have you read the book? Um, <laughs> yeah. Did you write the book? Probably not. Well, we have read your book. Whatever you want. Actually, I tell a lie. I listened to your book. So I oh, did you? Audible. Yeah. Oh, I, amazing. I do yeah. that because um, I paint, obviously. So yeah. I have to like multitask. Fantastic. Yeah. I loved it. Absolutely loved hearing all about your, you know, your upbringing and how you sort of have this connection with animals and pets and stuff like that. So I was wondering if you could talk on that a little bit. Like, first of all, um, amazing, you know, you're obviously an amazing broadcaster and you're an incredible person. And we're so happy that you're here. Um, I thought... Butter them up first. Yeah. Have me full. <laughs> you know have me full. Anyway, Slip yeah. that in there. <laughs> um, yeah, but do you know what? I was, I was talking to Charles about this yesterday. It's just funny how, first of all, you know, you've got, a career that's very much sort of in the public eye. You know, you're out there, your voice is being heard by so many people all around the country. And I, for me, when you hear about people that do jobs like that, I'm always really intrigued to know, did you ever suffer from any sort of uh, imposter syndrome or fear or, you know, anything that made you feel nervous going on there? Because I, that was one thing that I sort of picked up on your book is that you spoke a lot about your personal life, but you never really spoke in any detail about going on air and like doing that and being in the public and that having any kind of like fear response. Was that kind of like a natural thing for you or did you feel like you kind of put on a persona or was there, there fear going on there or? We always feel a bit of imposter. So should I be doing here, doing this? Because I'm so lucky to be doing this. This is amazing. And uh, uh, but but I feel very. I've always felt very comfortable with a microphone because possibly take the microphone away from me and I'm a gibbering wreck. Really, <laughs> there's something about that. And I was obsessed with radio from an early age. And then as as um, I got 12, 13 years old, I discovered that you could phone the local radio station, Radio Forth, and you could uh, get on the air and pretend to be people. And uh, I spent my life doing that, sort of for, for for a number of years, you know, phoning up and pretending to be an you know an old woman from Morningside, or pretending to be. A, <laughs> Could you still do the voice? A local yeah. council. <laughs> Could you do an impression of uh, the old woman? <laughs> oh my, my life's been my life's been threatened by vandals. <laughs> <laughs> and there was I remember there was a, there was a talk show called uh, Dial Webster. It was a Sunday morning, and I spent we spent uh, you know months just being all the characters on it as well, and. Uh, because we were pretty good. I was doing it with um, two friends of mine, both of whom are actors now. And we uh, uh, we just we just had such such great fun. I remember them saying, last week was a remarkable show. Thank you, one and all. I said, thank you, one. Uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we had a self-confessed vandal. Yes, we had an old woman <laughs> yeah. whose life had been terrified, terrorized by vandals. Yes, we had a doctor advising on rabies. Yes, a vet, oh, yeah. a vet oh, that advising on... That's my personal favorite, yeah. yeah. Where you told people that they should be bathing in Dettol. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? My mum and dad were doing we had a little terraced house in Edinburgh, and mum and dad were doing the roses outside. They were snipping the roses and um, uh, doing a little bit of uh, tinkering in the front in the front garden, uh, which is a few yards and then the main road. And I saw that they were out there, so I, I rang up the radio station to be on. And I I knew I was going to do it. I put the radio, I placed the radio out there just while they were they were cutting the roses. And that, so I rang up, and they said there was a, some scare about rabies getting to Edinburgh or something. Mm. And, and um, I, I rang up and said, I'm, a, I'm a, a practicing vet. And he said, oh, great. This is great that you've called. Um, so I want to talk, talk to you about this because we were asking for somebody to call up about rabies. I said, well, I, I know everything about it. I've actually studied it for, <laughs> P, for my PhD. I studied about uh, rabies as well. I'll, I'll tell you something. It's a terrible, ter <laughs> terrible disease. And I saw my mum and dad looking at each other. <laughs> and they said, what, 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 should, what should we do if we think? I said, immediately go up to the bath, fill the bath with water, and then chuck a load of dettol in it and um, bathe in dettol. Bathe in dettol. And that will uh, they'll make you um, immune to rabies um and so on it went and i saw mum and then mum mum walked in to the house and she went there's a dreadful man on the radio <laughs> <laughs> oh god that to yeah. me that just it's it takes such bravery i think to do that that's exciting well, you were saying mm, you were 12 13 mm. i mean i'm maybe older like 14 or 15 then yeah but, but still you know when you're mm. a teenager you're so self-conscious or mm. most most people are mm. <laughs> clearly you know you had some 
bravery about you to be able to phone up a radio show and put on these personas it's and so exciting it's yeah, so exciting and amazing it was like a bungee jump it was um, yeah. it was like getting on a motorcycle and going 110 miles an hour or doing something like that it was just knowing that you're on the radio and there's pe people that i just felt really comfortable with it mm. but as i say that you know you know gawky and and awkward and socially inadequate the rest of the time mm. but i just i just found that and i was obsessed with radio as well growing up just listen to it all the time, that local radio, national radio, Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, Radio 4. I just loved it. I just loved the magic of it. You know, some, somebody just, uh, you know, talking to a microphone and connecting. Um, mm. And, and I, I love the fact that it's one-to-one, -one, but it's also one-to a million and one as mm. well. I love that. Yeah. Do you feel like that you've kind of taken that into your career, that sort of ability to put on a persona and, and use that as almost like a mask when you're on air? To an extent, but I think that um, I, I love um, going through the fourth wall, if you like, lifting the curtain. And, 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 and as I think as you get more experienced, you can do that. I think the most successful broadcasters are those for whom there's a, as little gap between the persona and the person, mm. as like Wogan. Wogan's the, the ultimate because there was no gap between the persona and the person, was there? And I think you, I th I've spent my life trying to close that gap. I mean, if you watch the old Top of the Pops, you know, that's not me. It's <laughs> you know, kind of this ridiculous stuff. Whoa, 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 little boy showing off, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but, um, you know, radio is a medium whereby it's very, um, it's easier to get there on the because you're just talking to somebody and i think some of the television that i've done yeah but when you know long lost family for example you, you forget you're on the telly mm. um and you can just be yourself because i understand that territory but um and also but debate shows although it's it, it is you it, it's just you being in a situation whereby you're organizing a debate and mm. asking people questions so yeah it's, it's you know but it's you learn every day don't you mm. you learn every day yeah I was going to say, because there's one thing about being a broadcaster as well, because you're kind of um, making people feel less alone to a certain extent. Mm. And and I wondered actually writing your book, for example, and speaking about your various experiences, was that an opportunity for you to feel maybe a little less alone in some of the experiences you've had yeah, over the years? Yeah, well, it's good to share. We tell each other yeah. stories. We get around the campfire, talking to a microphone. You want the microphone just a little bit further away. Okay, from thank you. Because you're popping us all right. Yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah. Send you the invoice. So... Um, <laughs> Basically, um, yeah, it's 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 good to share. And the stuff I wrote about, you know, bipolar and this being bipolar, and the stuff I wrote about and my birth mother and the connection and my adoptive parents, how amazing that was, and I miss them every day. And the fact that the only reason I tra I, I well tracing my adoptive uh, uh, tracing my birth mother was a huge. I felt I'd been so disloyal and why was I doing that? And it was all muddled up and mixed up. Mm. And just to, to tell that, I, you just know from people getting in touch with you that that resonates and the whole adoption thing, I think it's good to talk about it and good to write about it and good to explain how you felt because if other people felt the same way, they wouldn't feel that they're so alone mm. as well. I don't want to sound sanctimonious about this, but it, to share stories like that, I think is really good. Oh, yeah. Really, really, really good. Well, I love people... When they share their stories with me as well, because then I think, oh yeah, that's that's how I felt, and oh you did that, I didn't do that, I did that, and oh wow, wow that's incredible. I love, mm. I love that as well. Because if you're not interested in other people, you might as well not be doing this. You know? Yeah, I think that's why your book was so enjoyable to read as well, because it's like you know stories about your life. I mean, autobi autobiographies in general are always good, I think, personally to read. But yeah, it's just funny stories and and the story about you phoning up the radio as a teenager and stuff and i was like giggling away like how well like, how did you you know how it was a validation as well sophie because i'd go to school and with a the old um cassette player and go into a class at break time and play the cassette with the phone calls and <laughs> over the weekend and there was massive amount of people listening and the classroom was bulging with people listening and laughing and, mm. and, and clapping you know mm. yeah so I mean you spoke about obviously the adoption quite a lot in your book and so what I what I got from that was that there was a sort of sense of 
trying to find your place in the world a little bit in terms of identity and a fear of people almost finding out that you were adopted or a fear of people who knew you were adopted kind of calling you out on it in, mm. in some way. And I remember you said that there was a time when one of your friends said to you, like, oh, do you know why you've got blue eyes? Mm. And your mum has green eyes or something. Mm. And, and, you know, your heart sort of dropped to your stomach. You're like, oh, my God, I'm about to be found out. Like, it's this terrible secret. And yet, I just I was just wondering if you could sort of speak on that, because it seems like there's like kind of a big difference between your personal life and feeling these sorts of feelings of like fear and shame and and abandonment, perhaps. And then, you know, in your the other side of that is you've got quite a confidence about you and you're kind of like phoning up radio shows as a teacher and you've got all these friends like you know you've got this confidence in other areas of your life do you feel like there was a sort of difference between the two you know you've got home life and then radio life or anything like that well you've with a lot of adopted people never feel totally valid and mm. uh, they all f always feel that other people see them as um not quite not quite belonging uh not quite being who they are not quite being who they ch should be. And so I think I think we all, and I've spoken to a lot of adopted people through Long Lost Family and through all the other stuff. Uh, I think we all have that little bit of insecurity and, and, and you know, a sense of, it's, it's all right having a sense of self, but if you, you've got to know who yourself is. You've got to know who you are. Mm. Who you might have been is a nagging thing um, all, all your life. Who, who you might have been, who you could have been. And you start obsessing about nature and nurture. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's there's a there's a burden with adoption, but that I would God, I was so lucky. Mm. You know, carrying this burden and carrying this insecurity is is one thing, and feeling that I didn't belong. But I was so lucky with my mum and dad; they were just incredible. And I always say that you know, people talk about when they say to me, "Oh, have you traced your real mum?" I say, hey, the, my, "My real mum is my mum. My real mum is my mum who I grew up with, who adopted me. That's my real mum, and he was my he was my real dad." Mm. Um, and um, but I still think about that night when I met my birth mother in 1989 and I was in a hotel in Dublin. I met her in the foyer. I still think about that. I still think about sitting there with her. And then suddenly the minute she came in, I started thinking about uh, what about mom and dad? You know, they're our real mom and dad. And then she, she started to try and be my mummy. You know, to, and then we went to her flat in the evening. She was like cooking for me. I've, got, I've never felt like that in my life. I just I wanted to run away mm. just wanted to run as fast as i could somewhere else um and it was nothing to do with her it was to, to, just to do with the fact that you know i just i just realized that um you know it's that's where i belonged although you know it was great to connect with her it's great to understand it's great to to know who she was what she'd been through um she had two children adopted within the space within the space of 18 months both of us adopted in edinburgh and uh, I met, um, my, I say in the book, I met my my birth sister, Esther. She got in touch with me. And there's a funny thing about that because, and this 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 really does apply when we're talking about sperm donation as well. Um, because my mother said one day she came in because I did have a vague recollection that my birth mother, Stella, had had another child, a daughter. I had a vague recollection of it that I'd been told at some stage. But when I was about 14, 15, 16, I remember mum was stalking outside the room and then she came in and she said, I need to talk to you. And I said, what? She said, um, are any of your girlfriends adopted? Mm. Yeah. God, yeah. Because Edinburgh is quite a small place. Yeah. And uh, uh, I said, no, nah. you know, she, because and she explained that. And I thought, oh, yeah, it all fits into place. But she was a year and a half older than me. But then when I met Esther, I um, we were exchanging notes because we were both sent to quite posh schools in Edinburgh, and we were and it's that sort of thing. Oh, do you know him? Or do you know her? Do you know him? Oh, I know yeah, all that family, and I know them. And there's a friend of mine who's a friend of her, and she's a friend of his. And I said, um, so who did you, who was your friend at school? She said, well, Julia Crichton was my best friend at school. Do you know her brother Matt? I said, he was one of my best friends. Matt was one of my best friends. That's incredible. And um, she said, well, the entire summer um, in 1978, my parents were away and I stayed with the Crichtons. It was the 78, the summer of 78. And I said, oh, that was the summer of the World Cup, 1978, Scotland, Argentina. Every day I went back to Matt's house with Ian and we sat on their sofa and we watched the football smoking Benson and Hedges. 
And uh, she said, um, I remember you. Wow. I remember wow. the three of you sitting there. And I said, and you were Julia's friend. I, I remember you. Yeah. Blimey, yeah, you'd, you'd kind of been like orbiting each other for mm. a while in mm. similar circles and stuff with no idea mm. that you were actually like half siblings. But she was the big sister's friend, you know, so it was, there was, there was that, it was a year and a half's a lot when you're 15, yeah, 16, yeah. how much is that, 78, 17? A year and a half is like a, <clears throat> it's like a generation away, isn't it? Yeah, mm. that's incredible. Incredible. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Mm. When we did meet, we, we, very quickly had our it's the first thing she said to me was hey you're not very tall <laughs> <laughs> nice you, that? Yeah, no. she, you have you much look much bigger on the radio <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i was kind of oh, ideas man. of people and uh i said uh what i always say i said you know i'm five but eleven and three quarters and uh <laughs> and she said uh, well she was expe expectations great expectations mm. tall expectations mm. she had in her mind some six foot four inch rugby player or something like that but yeah uh, you're not short though i'm not short but i'm not a six foot four inch rugby player yeah. you just it just had had her had you when you kind of knew that she was out there somewhere had you built up an idea of what she looked like or what she was going to be like well Which i thought she'd look like me but she doesn't look like me you with I, a wig yeah 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 well, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool um <laughs> but I, no, I i just i thought she would look like me but she looks very different she's yeah. sort of more angular um but then when we traced her birth father and sort of met her relatives we kind of she looks like them mm. but there are similar of course there are similarities what is interesting is that we our brains work in a very different in a very similar way very similar way you know the brain is an organ and it's um it goes there and it goes there and you can i can and, and i find it very easy to talk to her and we talk in the same way to each other and my sister who i love deeply who i grew up with um we're very different when it comes to that and i I've, i find it quite hard phoning fiona a lot because she'll she wants an hour on the phone mm. which is it which is her you know mm. she's an amazing person she, but she likes an hour on the phone and i like five minutes on the phone mm. i think I, I think you can do everything in five minutes and Esther's the same. So it's just little things like that. You know, how you doing? Fine, fine, fine. Bit of a laugh, bit of a laugh, bit of info, bit of a laugh, bit of info. How you doing? See you later. Boom. It's all there. Mm. It's all there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and uh, so, I, but very, looking for, you look for similarities, don't you? You look for things that are the same. And we couldn't f immediately find any. So we got down to taking our shoes and socks off. Because I actually mentioned, I've got a very, very strange second toe. <laughs> and she said, so have I. <laughs> and so so we had our shoes and socks off and uh they're identical i'll, I'll show you now yeah i was gonna say yeah, i was yeah. asking a question like is it actually weird or is it one of those things where you it's think not webbed, it's is weird, it but it's, it's not, not webbed <laughs> I said, yeah i've got six toes no, yeah um now what it is, is this is a podcast first examining people's feet <laughs> yeah, yeah. podiatrist cast <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh my goodness nice we could, we nice gone, yeah, yeah. Thanks. No, no, it's just that it's it's. You see the second one, a horrible. Feet. I wouldn't say that. That's that unusual. You've it's basically a lot longer. Got a, that you've so, got a long toe. So I've got very similar long toe, second toe. Yeah, I think that's that. That's a Greek toe. Is it? Oh. So you've got Greek. You've got Greek toes because there's what, a different. What, why are they called Greek toes? Well, see, I think a Roman toe is they slant down. Yeah, I've got Roman down. toes. Yeah, but Have Greek, you? yeah. Greek, your second toe is longer than the um, big toe. It's, it's quite common. It's mm. it is common. But um, it's distinctive. Yeah. And I knew someone that had that and she yeah. was obsessed with it. All she all used to talk about was her long toe. And like yeah. the time we went on holiday, she'd be oh, I can't get my long toe out. <laughs> <laughs> but what was... It's what, impressive, Nikki. Thank you. thank you. What was great was seeing somebody else who had the same feet. Right? Yes. Are, are, that is the good. story of adoption, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, I think me and my sister have the same almost identical feet. Yeah, you might okay. need this for to the publicity. Take a picture. We definitely yeah. need Actually, this for I'm the publicity. Take yeah. a picture of you. Take yeah, a picture of your toe. Yeah, take a picture of me. Take a picture of my toe. This isn't how I imagined this would go down. <laughs> oh, yeah, look, they're horrible, horrible feet. <laughs> But who who has nice feet though? To who does exactly. come out? I mean, like you exactly. know, I don't know. Sometimes I see people with nice feet, and I'm like, oh, "You've got nice feet," and then oh, they think okay. it's weird that I've brought it up. Beyonce's but... got nice feet. 
Yeah. I bet she, she has. Yeah. She wouldn't, Beyonce wouldn't be good. What do you mean you oh, bet? You haven't seen them then? No, I just reckon she would have nice feet. Yeah, yeah. Mind you, she does a lot she of dancing. She wears a lot of heels. She's probably yeah. got Yeah, they're right. They're right. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's not like I have a foot fetish. I just want to say. Exactly. Like when you see this is taking a turn. There's all now, the pictures. I've got thousands of pictures of people's feet at home. And I've got... <laughs> 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 oh, Another man, one to add to the wall. Yeah. But that was, that was it. Was just that's, that's what we use. Widdicombe's <laughs> feet. Oh, my God. Are they? <laughs> are they? <laughs> yeah. Sexy. Sexy but, feet, Widdicombe. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... Um, I um that was it. That's adoption. You know, look, yeah. Look at that. You feel know, like me. Somebody's like you, even if yeah. it's their feet. Mm. You know. And then yeah. we had, my And you could are... say like you, you you found mutual friends that were similar. So there was obviously you were drawn. What together. is a foot fetish club? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you met. You left that That's out of right. your story originally. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, exactly. Um, just finding finding someone who's like you. All your life, you want to find somebody who's like you. People who are like you. And, yeah. Uh, I'm. I mean, I completely get when people. Or brought up in, um, you know, um, cross, what do you go, cross, um, cross cultural adoptions. Mm. And so, and I've spoken to so many kids, you know, black kids who grew up in white families, and you get, you get it in a general sense, just wanting to have, be, have someone who's like me. Mm. Well, now someone who looks like me. And that's just an adoption thing, but it's an adoption thing times a million yeah. for a kid who's grown up in that situation. And having done a lot of work in adoption, knowing what it's like. And so, if you mentioned the blue eye thing, mm. my friend said to me, Why have you got blue eyes? And I said, Oh, I'm different. Mm. I'm different. Imagine what it's like. With if your skin color is different, if your ethnicity, yeah. ethnicity is different, and understanding that as far as we go, as far as we can, we need to f have matches, adoption matches, because it was difficult enough for me. Mm. So goodness only what it's like. And I said that once in an interview, and then the Telegraph like really did <laughs> me for it. The Telegraph oh, really? put this thing about. Yeah, okay, yeah, they're saying that and love, love at the end of the days matter and you can have to move for your adoption. It's, it doesn't matter if you're black or white and stuff like that. I remember when they rang me up and they said, did you really say that? And I said, yeah, it's, every single adoption agency in Britain says it. Next question. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Next question. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, what you're talking about is belonging, isn't it, mm. at the end of the day? And, and obviously growing up, you kind of had your issues with that do you feel like when you met your biological mum it's kind of solidified your belonging with your adoptive family you know yeah, you suddenly had more of a connection with your parents because you saw them for they were kind of yeah thing. that's a great question because a really good question because it's um it sort of uh, confirmed everything mm. and, and made made sense and because i knew because i'd had the question answered a lot of people in long lost families say Oh, but what if it's not a happy ending? You you introduce people, and what if it's not a happy ending? And I always say that, well, it is a happy ending because anything else is a bonus. That this person now has all the questions about their past. They've got a brand new past, but all those questions are answered, and they've met their birth mother or their sister or their brother or the father or the son, whatever. So now they know, and they won't be going through the rest of their life wondering. Mm. So I'd stopped wondering and wondering. So I'd stopped wondering and wondering. And uh, I knew, and I, you, you, you come back, you come home, and it's a place you've never been to, but it's a better place, mm. in, a, in a sense. And uh, but I, you know, I cherish my my um, relationship with her. I've met some, also meeting my birth father. I've met lots of fascinating relatives, and uh, I, 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 I don't regret it. She was very needy, and she was, you know, she'd had a difficult life. She'd had an awful life, but um, I, I think that. You know, bipolar type two that I am. She was bipolar type one. She was very ill throughout a lot of her life, and I, I think the, she had these. She was a Protestant nurse. She had wild affairs with two Catholic policemen, young Catholic policemen in Dublin. One of whom was the father of Esther. The other was the father of me. Mm -hmm. And uh, the operative being on the wild, and that's fine because you know having a manic fit and having having sex and this you know led to me mm. and i think that when i was diagnosed with bipolar i felt it was it's been difficult um but also i quite enjoy the ups and the ups have been really good in my career um i adhd is a big massive comorbidity but all that stuff is good uh, you know if it's under control um because the brain can go bingity bing bingity bing bingity bing and that's um, very useful in my life. But I did feel when I found that out that it was uh, a gift to me in some senses. Mm. We are what we are, mm. you know. Mm. 
we are and people i think people categorize in mental health and say you, we, you're like that and you're we over medicalize and we over label to an extent but everyone's what they are aren't they yeah i was going to say to you did that give you some not closure as such because obviously works in progress but actually finding out those diagnoses is actually help a bit i mean the adhd thing is that a, is that a relatively new thing after the bipolar diagnosis or was that something that came together well it, it, it was after bi bipolar diagnosis because my daughter's adhd mm. and um she um she has to, she was diagnosed she was useless at school she was diagnosed we were lucky enough to be uh, a privilege and i i thank my lucky stars that we were in a situation to get a proper diagnosis and then to to get the proper medication and she literally she took the medication uh, for when she was working and she went from a disaster at school to a stars mm. like that and part of me thinks that's fantastic mm. and the other part of me weeps inside at the potential that is that is out there and kids who are not diagnosed kids who are not in a privileged situation that i'm in or that kirsty's in and kids who are suffering uh, all the time who could be brilliant you mm. know who could be Running a country mm. uh, a lot better than the country is being run. <laughs> Who could be? Uh, and it's it breaks it that breaks my heart. It does, and I feel actually I, I carry the burden of middle class guilt about that every day because I think I am so lucky. Yeah, yeah, of course, because you were sort of able to get mm. get a diagnosis and treatment as well, which has kind of helped you. So when I went, to, so she basically said, "Look, you you are a, you've got all the kinds of signs of ADHD," and I said, "No, it's bipolar." That's what it, she said. No, no, no. I just, you know, because she's read all the books and mm -hmm. Tina, my wife's read all the books. And you classic, classic signs of it. You know, yeah, you can't, you can't watch a film. You have to keep asking everybody what's going on. She's your brain drift drifts away. You can't do that. You can't do that. But then you get the hyper focus, get complete hyper focus mm. and stuff. Um, and I said, ah. <laughs> and they said, go and get checked out. Again, I'd luck enough. I went to along to a guy, checked out, and he, he had a thing and said, when, do you da, 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 yeah do you da, 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 yeah and he, i did this massive <laughs> i was like tick to 98 percent of the stuff wow and i said no i'm bipolar type 2 he said no there's a 30 percent comorbidity my bipolar type 2 with adhd well now, as i'm saying this i'm very very aware that i'm it's labeling and it's medicalizing and it comes back to my first point but it does explain a lot it mm. does explain a lot about how i think and what i've done because he said that's the other thing he said it's not a condition for you it's not a problem because you're relatively intelligent. Uh, so, well, thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tip that one off. Yeah. <laughs> you've got great feet. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you've, got, you've got great feet. You've nailed it. No, you've got great feet. You're, you're, you're relatively intelligent and you're in a job that is 100% suited yeah. to your brain. Yeah. Mm. I've, I've got friends who have uh, ADHD and stuff like that and some, some diagnosed, some suspected and stuff like that. And what strikes me is that Next to one of them. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say. Have you? Have you, you, think you are? <laughs> I haven't been diagnosed, but I'm. Uh, yeah. I'm pretty, pretty sure. sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. What you like at school? But, uh, yeah. Oh, awful! At school. They're terrible. Yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely terrible. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then you find your niche. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And and again, I I like my brain. It's probably quite annoying for other people. Yeah. But I like the way my brain works. Completely. So I wouldn't mm. necessarily want to get a diagnosis. Yeah. You yeah. know, it wouldn't give me the, any closure or anything. It wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't bother me. I did a um a podcast on it with. Ian Lee, who's got ADHD and mm. bipolar, same as me, and my daughter Kirsty, who's great on the podcast, who's great, and uh, we did pod podcast together, and it's like three ADHD people in there. It's, uh, <laughs> we, we keep changing the subject from each other. One person, and at one point, I went, "What are you thinking of right now?" We all having a conversation about something, and what are you thinking of right now? And what are you thinking of right now? And we're, thinking, we're all thinking a different thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh God! But, but I've got a having, monkey having that's a clashing two yeah. <laughs> symbols together in my yeah, head. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was it was really you know that thing of, you know that thing where you know all of a sudden you come come from a tangent about something completely different mm. and everyone goes whoa wait where did that come from all the time yeah yeah well yeah. i think people with different sort of brain you know people that think in different ways or you know people that are neurodivergent or whatever you want to call it and the other thing about it is you just interrupt people yeah <laughs> i know i noticed that with him and you know what the more Sorry, excitable to do that. it gets the more that. interrupting there interrupt. is <laughs> just the gag <laughs> i was like oh sorry i wasn't prepared for that <laughs> sophie what were you saying what were you saying <laughs> Um, anyway, what was I saying? <laughs> <laughs> see? This is it. Like, I don't think I have ADHD no. or anything mm. like that. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I've got other stuff going on. Yeah, though, don't don't yeah. get me wrong. Yeah. But yeah, like, they're often it's all the it's always the creative people and the people. 
the reason why I probably have quite a lot of people in my life that do have these sorts of things going on is because I tend to drift towards creative people or people who are a bit different or just have different ways of looking at the world. And so for me, for me, looking, you know, as an outsider looking in, I see it as their superpower, you know, like I wouldn't want to change anybody in my life. And, and my friend who, who, uh, has ADHD calls it a sparkle or something yeah. It's like, mm. yeah I think it's a nice way of looking at, at that and you know as long as it's under control and, and you know the lows aren't affecting you and in, your life suits as well yeah. your life yeah. and your job's got to suit otherwise can you imagine you'd be like you're like a caged animal mm. you know in that, in that situation yeah, yeah. Um, so you were undiagnosed for many years and so did you find that the lows were particularly difficult or was it they were kind of you know, manageable, and it was just getting that diagnosis which kind of made your life a bit easier. Or well, the, the the bipolar lows were terrible. Mm. You know, all my life I just thought, oh, you know, yeah, I mean, you know, it's Giles. It's just, you know, it's just it's all consuming, isn't it? And it's that, you know, um, it's that, um, uh, you know, if, even if someone says, "Are you okay?" Just the effort of trying to kind of explain why you're not mm. okay is just. Mm. You know. But when I had, I talk about it as well. In, in in the book i hate people in interviews who say i say that in the book yeah i hate that mm. so i will will so it I say, yeah, just that I, you know anyway i say this in the book i once interviewed somebody in, and they <laughs> said the it book. like every part i say this in the book and it's in the book and it's yeah in, yeah i spent my life taking that but bit out just they, <laughs> in fact i bought the book with me actually yeah so yeah, yeah. Really yeah exactly <laughs> but they sounded bad they sound like a plug you know i'm not plugging the book anymore it's out and it's been Find and it's gone we won't yeah. say what it's called One <laughs> of the, oh, okay. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's been and it's gone but um i, I had this breakdown um at uh, i was basically i was at work and i was not constantly on work because i was fixated with um, something that I'd, I'd I searched elephants on for the news and news and I was fixated with something that happened in India, where a family of elephants had been scythed through and mowed down by one of those mm. trains that goes through the forest, hurtles through the forest, and the the, the the elephants who survived from the family were trying to get back to their dead loved ones, and there was lots of people around, and it just it absolutely broke my heart and became utterly fixated with it. And I couldn't do anything until so like the Secretary of State for Business and Industries on and joins us now. So tell us, about, I mean, surely this particular plan for industry is not going to work because of the pressure, but boom, and I'm doing like that. And I'm sitting, listen, listen can, can bear, I was in complete autopilot. And then when it finished, I, I had to go up to Manchester as used, uh, it was a broadcasting house. And I could have literally stumbled out. And the whole world was getting on top of me and it had building, building, building up to a climax. And I got to Euston Station and I collapsed at Euston Station. There used to be a green sward of grass there. And I collapsed and I just started weeping and weeping and weeping. And um, the, um, the uh, it's, te it's, te it's terrible. Well, it's difficult to talk about it. But so that, and then people were kind of just walking past and I'm sure that a couple would say, "Oh, that's the bloke who used to do Top of the Pops." He's a, oh. you know, he's a twat then, and he's a twat now. And uh, but oh, but, but I um, people just they walk over you, don't they? I wasn't I wasn't at the time thinking, "Why is everybody walking over me? Why doesn't somebody help me?" But I just mm. thinking back, people just walk past you. How strange! I know. Yeah. I, was Nobody going, we, I was literally weeping, and and I, and I rang Tina and said, "This is terrible. I can't carry on with this. I can't carry on with this." And then she said, "Come home." Uh, come home to us and you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it all sorted out. We'll get it all sorted out. Get in a taxi and come home. And then she said, and come home to Maxwell. I let my dog, And mm. I just knew that I wouldn't have to communicate. I could communicate on a completely different level. And I got home and I was weeping and crying and Tina took me upstairs and I'd lay me on the bed. And then I just heard the tinkle of the collar and he jumped up under the bed and he put his, put his head on my chest. And um, there was that's the that's the empathy of the wild. Mm. That's the understanding of the pack, understanding how everyone's feeling on a very on a very profound and um, deep level. Profound and deep are the same words, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. A very special connection that animals, higher mammals, have and understand and need to have and understand. And it's not Disney, it's Darwin. It's a complete survival of the pack. And he knew, he absolutely knew that I was not in a good place mm -hmm. and he made me better. Yeah, it's like a full, it's like a full circle moment, isn't it? You know, you felt that way because of the way that humans were treating animals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, on on route home, while you're clearly suffering, humans are just kind of like bulldozing past you, mm -hmm. you know, without really paying any attention. 
and then it's Maxwell that comes in and I know. Uh, yeah it's it's amazing and yeah it's it's good to hear that from somebody say you know speaking up about wildlife and and animals and yeah they're, they're empathy mm. as well i mean elephants you know they're altruistic mm. creatures elephants are very mm. intelligent I, I do love an elephant in fact I, I do think most people do like elephants actually they're quite popular in, just in terms of my artwork i find that people love I'm just they, they sell well in here. they sell well sophie green fine art <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the elephants are popular and i don't know if that's just you know people like to have an elephant mm. like oh i love elephants but or if people have had experiences with elephants like they've got a huge people. emotional range as well elephants yeah to see an a family of elephants mourning its dead is one of the most affecting sights in nature oh, it's yeah. incredible to it's, it's heartbreaking but it's also kind of life affirming as well mm. when you see that, that that level of understanding and self awareness existing out with humanity and our own species, which so often lacks empathy and understanding and self awareness, it's kind of it's it's God with a small g. I'm not religious, but it's mm. that that's that's the, the famous American evolutionary biologist had a great f phrase for the religious. Um, you're looking for God in all the wrong places. Mm. Yeah. That's very profound. It's good for I'm going for a piss. Is that all right? Okay. I'm allowed to. Well, I was going to say, well, like, we, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Nikki, I mean, yeah. it's been fantastic yeah. to Thank talk you to you so today. Much. And obviously, we've kind of come full circle because we sort of started on this. Mm. Um, Thank you for sharing, you know, your experiences with us, and you know, it's really, fine. Really appreciate, it, really appreciate. It. And uh, we'll say, say go, 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 go for another week. Do you want to come yeah. out and say yeah. goodbye in a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. <laughs> I think I might have heard the door go. Actually. Yeah. That yeah. might have been. Really might be, yeah. Oh, that was great. What time is it? Should we do some jokes while we wait? Do you know any jokes? I know, uh, no. Not but rude ones. I don't know any rude ones. I can't retain jokes. Yeah, no, I've, I've struggled to remember them as well. The only joke I ever say the kids, it's like a kid's joke, is um, what do you call an, um, an exploding ape? Mm. Don't tell this in front of Nikki. No. <laughs> a baboon. <laughs> oh, God. That's the only joke I can oh, remember. Oh, man. Not yeah, I can only remember really, really bad ones. Yeah. Um, yeah great the um the, my podcast uh, is back is back at the beginning of um um when is it when are we are beginning of march are we in february now yeah beginning yeah. of march end of the month and uh by the time this goes out it'll probably have been out yes it? yeah it was well out but episode one and uh i have heard it, it is i think it's one of the most incredible things i've ever done um oh, okay. uh, that i've been involved with is that all the uh, all the stuff at the edinburgh academy all the abuse that we've been talking mm. about and this guy edgar who abused i witnessed his abuse when we were 10 years old but he abused so many of my friends and contemporaries and he's still you know at large although now somebody has come forward in south africa um where he taught as well um there was an abuser at my school called uh, hamish dawson who uh, as well another one there's lots of them, but another one who abused me and many other people, who sexually abused me and many other people. And when all that publicity came out, we tried to get in touch with Hamish Dawson's family because I was going to talk about it and he's dead. Mm. And we made great efforts, but we couldn't get anywhere. The school didn't pass anything on. And so his daughter saw it in a headline, right? Um, and she was estranged from him, completely estranged from him. She didn't know the extent of it. She, he knew he was a he was a bad person. She didn't know quite how bad. And then she got in touch, and she's reached out to a lot of the boys who were abused by Hamish Dawson, and uh, she wanted to do the podcast. And so I I sat down, went to a studio in Edinburgh, and Jenny, she's, she's an incredible woman, um, an amazing woman, and so brave, and um, she was a psychotherapist now as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a, a a conversation with her in the in the podcast you know it's wow quite, quite, yeah what's yeah. it called the podcast a different different yeah brilliant and, yeah and was did that again using the word closure did it obviously didn't do that but did it give you an opportunity to obviously to talk to her about these experiences and she was obviously estranged from her father anyway mm. but do you think it gave her some closure perhaps? i think it did i think she she thought it was an important thing to do on behalf of of, of all the all the others who suffered yeah. Um, and uh, I think she did and that's why 
to use the phrase reaching out was so amazing and i think it, it may it helped her make sense of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well um i mean that whole process has been we put our we, we had the lid on it for so long and then i just heard this radio program and it just whew, it all went like that and it's been a good thing you know lots of lots of solidarity lots of guys of a certain age who are still little boys you know when, mm -hmm. when they think about it all so yeah that's been a that's that's all been a good thing so that's one to, to watch out for different amazing yeah yeah, different. yeah what a what an incredible mm. thing to do um and i'm sure there'll be probably be so many people out there that will also benefit from listening to that with well, similar experiences and well uh, when, when we did it when i first came out about it and spoke about it on the radio they had to do it all day on five live because the lines went crazy with people who'd never spoken about it before never and it's happened to so many people, so many people, mm. um, when they were when they were children. I mean, what do we, you know, what do we do about it? What's I don't know, but you know, it's people, kids are still suffering. But there has to be mandatory reporting and all that. But that apart, this has been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Nikki. Thank and you I, very much. I, I really appreciate how candid you've been with us, and uh, and appreciate your time today. So thank I you so it. much. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, I guess people should go and check out the podcast different mm. yeah uh, and yeah, buy the book as well yeah called called one of the fat part of the family one of, fam one of the family fam right right we are fa <laughs> we are family uh, i Just got family. all my sisters and me yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a family affair <laughs> yeah. uh, i feel like you got that name from somewhere that i can't quite yeah. put my finger on it <laughs> yeah, yeah. um uh, one of the family yeah because yeah. a big picture of maxwell on it the front good. yeah it's a beautiful picture yeah. of you and maxwell yeah. and great. it was during lockdown when we had the photograph taken so we can't get a photographer around we can't get a photographer around. but i have one of those nice cameras yeah and mm. so i said to kirsty my uh, adhd daughter She's got a very good eye. I said to her, that's how we define her. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> one. That's right. Um, ADHD, as she calls herself. Oh. So we, uh, she took At least she's not letting it define her. No, 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 exactly. Yeah. She's We're doing, doing that for her. She's doing, yeah, she's doing theology at uni at the moment. Um, and she, the best kind of theologist, she thinks, you know, religion is bollocks, but she, yeah. she loves it. And um, she took the photograph. And she took a really good photograph. Fantastic. And they have a wow. standard kind of photographic fee that books have to pay legally. You take a photograph on the book. Lots of people read the book. You have to pay a fee. So she got 300 quid for it. Fantastic. So she, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. You're definitely keeping it in the family. family. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nikki Campbell, thank you so much. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Giles, Sophie, brilliant. Loved it.